Welcome to Three Books with Neil Pasricha, where each chapter we uncover and discuss the three most formative books of an inspiring individual. We believe books change lives, and that's why we are the only podcast in the world by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Thanks so much for joining us. So I was at the bar, late at night, by myself, as I often go by myself, and I decided to just hail an Uber to get home, right? So let's say it's like midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning, I press the Uber button on my phone, and sure enough, it says, Vish will be here in two minutes. I have this thing where when a driver is picking me up, I always just check his rating or her rating, and I check how many rides he or she has given. And in this case, the guy's rating was something like 4.98 or 4.99. And he'd given like thousands of rides. And when I saw it was 4.98 or 4.99, I was like, well, this must be some newbie driver. This has got to be someone who's just like, just started driving and got like three ratings or whatever. But no, this guy's given thousands of rides. I was like, I couldn't believe the rating was so high. So I started showing it to everybody at the bar. I was like, have you ever seen a rating this high? Have you ever seen a rating this high? And everybody's like, no, no, never seen. I was like, I think I'm going to get picked up by the world's greatest Uber driver. I was kind of excited. So I go outside, the car's parked there, an immaculately clean Honda. I open the door and this friendly guy, like with his beaming eyes and a beaming smile kind of looks me in the eye and he's just like, is it Neil? Is it Neil? And I'm like, yeah, it's Neil. This is Neil. He's like, come on in. He's just so, so happy. And I sit down in his uh, Uber and he confirms the address with me. Uh, he asked me, he, he starts some conversation. And I said, you know, I think you might be the best Uber driver in the world. He's like, is it true? And I was like, I don't, I don't know if it's true. Is it, is it true? And he's like, he tells me there's no leaderboard. There's no data. Uber doesn't share any of these numbers with any of the drivers. There's no way to tell. But I'm like, nobody has a 4.99 rating, period. It's harder to get your rating higher the higher you go, right? And he's given thousands of rides. He's like, how long have you been driving Uber? He's like, one year. I'm like, what did you do before this? He's like, I, I was an executive at a telecommunications company in India. I was like, really? I was like, have books affected your life at all? The service from this guy is amazing. And he's just like, books are everything. Like, books are everything. Forgive my Indian accent. I, I feel like it's the one accent I, I'm, I can sometimes try to do since I grew up around it. But he's like, he's like, books are everything. It changed my life. And he's like, you know, he talks about how you can take 200 years of the world's compressed knowledge from all the great wisdom of our ages and like it can change your direction. I was like, man, I got to have this guy on three bucks, right? So I start texting him over the next few weeks. He's impossible to get a hold of. He's got this beautiful out of office text message that pops up saying, sorry, I am driving. Please text me with like a thumbs up. And finally, uh, I'm able to hail him. And I do. And you're about to hear the ride we had. We went from my place up and around the city of Toronto to the airport, back down to the CN Tower. And I cannot tell you how interesting and how informative this guy is. Because these jobs with Uber, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but can you not just like press a button and get a job? Like it's it's a bit like of a, it's a commodity job. You sort of see Uber racing to have the self-driving car. So this job not only is... Um, kind of low value, but it's also becoming obsolete quickly based on the self-driving test that they're doing. And yet this guy cared so much about the job. He cares so much. He, he has all these interesting techniques and tools he does to make it the best service experience of your life. Wait till you hear the things that he does with, with his mats, with what food he eats, with what he says, with the lines, the script he has. It's unbelievable. If you listen to chapter three of three books with Seth Godin, you heard Seth say, we should do a book together called 4.99, The Secrets of Service from the World's Greatest Uber Driver. You are about to listen to one of the most interesting conversations, <clears throat> interesting conversations I ever had with what I think is the world's greatest Uber driver. I have taken thousands of Uber rides. I've never seen a rating this high. I, I put the call out to any of you. Do, if any of you can find a 4.99 rating with like around 5,000 rides, let me know. Because I think this guy might be it. I think I might have stumbled upon the world's greatest Uber driver. And I'm going to post on threebooks.co with the blog post that over he's this chapter, he's given me permission to post like his picture, the profile, and the ratings and reviews. You can see his last 500 ratings, which is all that the drivers are allowed to see, are all five stars with thousands of compliments. 
This is a life-changing story about what it means to set your own standards, to set your own high bar, to live up to a version of yourself that you see in your mind and in your eyes. I was delighted to have this conversation in the back of an Uber with Vishwas Agarwal. Please enjoy this chapter of Three Bucks. going to someone else. Okay, well, it's just finding your ride, looking for drivers, connecting me to three nearby drivers. So it's uh, probably me. They're, uh, they're estimating. They're authentic. No, it's not you. I got Mark. So you can 4. cancel. 4.91. One. Cancel. Sorry, Mark. I'm looking for Vish. Cancel, Mark. Try again. Yep. Request Uber X. What is your rating? Who does way? Uber Pool? Who does Uber Select? Uber Black? <laughs> Too many options. Yeah, so many people, so so many options. I got oh, it. Oh, it's got you. Okay, yeah, good. It's me. Connecting you to three nearby drivers. Vish. Oh, that's oh, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Did we it. got it. We got it. We got it. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, Vish. Four nine nine. He's a four nine nine. How many rides does he have? Uh, four thousand eight hundred and seventy four. All right, baby, take me to the airport. All right. I am with Vish. This is an incredible story, guys. I cannot wait to tell you because I am in my second ever ride with Vishwas, right? Yeah, that's right. Did I say your name properly? Yeah, perfect. Okay, fantastic. Like, I met you, what was it, like a week ago? Um, two weeks ago, maybe? Two weeks ago, maybe, yeah. Two, two weeks ago. Can you turn the sound? <laughs> Are you able to turn off the, the GPS sound? Oh, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know, just so that the lady doesn't talk to us the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn left, right. Um, so basically, I, I, I'm at a bar, uh -huh. it's, it's kind of late at night, uh -huh. and I am having a drink. I had just come from a speech, and I, I sometimes I like to just go out, I'm, my, you know, my wife and my kids are already asleep, I'm like, I'll just go get one drink and kind of, you know, just kind of de-stress and, and just kind of calm down before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. So I went and had a drink, mm -hmm. called an Uber to go home, I call an Uber probably three or four times a day, and of course, it's you. I never met you before, but I looked at the rating. I was like, 4.99, no way. I was like, oh, it's probably some guy who just started at Uber. Like, it's, he's got 12 rides. Uh -huh. So I scroll up, and it's you. You got like 4,500 rides. So I show everybody at the bar, I'm like, look, this is the best Uber driver in the world. And everybody around me is like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what's he gonna do? So I come out, uh -huh. and sure enough, I open the door, and what did you say to me when I walked in? Uh-huh. What'd you say? Uh, I I probably said last time or this time? Last time. Oh, hey, hi, is it Neil? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And I said, I said, yeah. you have 4.9 rating. And I thought you said, I don't give myself the rating. You guys give me the exactly. rating. Exactly, <laughs> that's just because of you. I know. So it's funny because I went to Bangkok, uh -huh. Thailand, uh -huh. and I, we went to the number one cooking class on TripAdvisor. Uh-huh. And... We, my, my wife and I are really excited because it's the number one cooking class. You know what happened? We got to the cooking class. They were like, we're the number one uh, cooking class on TripAdvisor. Here's a coupon for uh -huh. filling it out on TripAdvisor. Here's a card. So you fill it out on TripAdvisor. The whole time we're at the cooking class, they're telling us to go on TripAdvisor and fill out their rating. Uh -huh. So it's like they hacked the system. Exactly. But you didn't, you didn't hack the system. You didn't tell people to rate you that way. No, we don't have nothing, right? Yeah. So how did you get a 4.99 rating for 5,000 rides? To be honest, I don't even know this is the highest rating because we don't uh, we don't get to see other drivers rating at all. There's no place we come to know about any rating of other drivers. To be honest, believe me, Neil, you were the first person who told me that I have certain rating. I cannot believe that. Yes, it is. I know. I believe that. So you don't have like a little leaderboard or anything. No, we don't. But, we, but you, I, look at me. You do no way. Some guys got 5.0 with 5,000 rides. There's just no way. Because I, I take Uber three, four times a day. I've done that for like a year. Like I've bounced around from a meeting to a meeting here and there in different cities, different countries. Uh -huh. I've never barely seen a rating over 4.95. Uh -huh. 4.96, 4.9. Everyone you go higher by 0.1 there, it's uh -huh. impossible. It's impossible. We have to maintain almost like an average of last 500 rated trips. Yeah. 500 rated, when I say, it means it should be at least 1,000 trips in actual because 50% riders only rate. 50% yeah. don't rate at all. They don't even bother. So, uh, And the people that rate are probably the ones that love you, love you, love you, or hate you, hate you, hate you. Like, it's only the extreme people that even bother, right? That's it, that's it, yeah. And a lot of people even promise you, hey, I'll, I'm gonna rate you, I'm gonna do this, this. But when you later go back and check the account, nobody bothers. They lie to your face. Exactly. 
they lie happens. to your face because it's not that important for them believe nah, me. Yeah. I know what you mean and it used to be the app kind of forced you to do it before you did the next before, call before yeah but I now, think Uber has t- taken off that option because it's irritating as a customer yeah right? they don't want to let customer go right well the, the thing that struck me that's right they don't want to let customer go is when I got in the car with you the first time I could not believe your rating and the first thing I said to you was your rating and the second thing you said to me was Neil I'm not in the driver business what did you tell me oh yes it is not I'm not I'm not a cab driver this is uber the one word uber uber is absolutely different from doing a regular cab driving thing this is a customer service thing right you're supposed to be more skilled with people right I love I love talking to people I love you know and top of it what I believe driving uber is why it is different it is the same job what other people doing at other people other places right why are you trying to take it different why are you trying to see your uber driver like a driver thing right a lot of uber drivers i think don't understand this they still uh, want uh, to be treated as drivers yeah and they want to they don't want to accept this also well drivers even no offense but it's kind of even a, like sometimes they just want to be a robot they just follow the map but like they don't even know where they're going they like they don't even exactly it's like so why they they're totally in their own world they got the big air freshener the music's blaring it's not even a driver it's like absolutely. i feel like i'm in a car with no person in it absolutely see why why can't you compare a driving of car with flying an airplane he's also a driver Mm-hmm. like the pilot right yeah so then you feel good about what you're doing then you feel good about other people also when you're driving right but why do you care like you say it's not the same as a taxi okay you say it's not the same as a cab but why do you care so much about your rating and doing so much as an uber driver but when nobody else cares why do you care so much oh well to be honest and answer your question i would really like to take you back in my uh, past life i'd love to hear it i i So I I always have had my one of my mantra either I do the things or I don't but if I do the things I try to do it the best mm-hmm. either uh, always in all my corporate life all my past jobs Where are you from? I'm from India originally. Where in India? Uh I'm from Central India. Central India. Yeah, yeah. The city is known as Indore. Mhm. Indore is a born and raised born and raised there mm-hmm. yeah Indore is a city which is uh, like a business capital of uh, the province known as MP MP is Madhya Pradesh okay yeah so i'm from there i born i raised there i got my studies there done and then i started my career there uh, so i worked with a lot of sales jobs and marketing jobs in the beginning of my life i started with coca cola is my first job first job was coca cola yeah i got How picked up, you? i got i got picked up from my mba campus You went so you have your MBA. Oh yeah, I have one. So, okay, you got your MBA. <laughs> then yeah. you got a job with Coca-Cola. How yeah. old were you then? You get can you guess me? I mean, I'm going to guess you're 45. You're too close. I I was 76 born. I'm 42. You're 42. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry for guessing older. I'm so I feel so bad. It's like no, it's lose fine. lose proposition. No, 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 it's so fine. So you're 42 now. Uh-huh. Well, how old were you when you worked at Coke? Can I just say, can I just ask how common is it for someone born where you were born mm-hmm. to get their MBA and get a job at Coke? Is that an extremely rare thing? Is that, you know, people can do it? Is it scrap and save? Is it scholarships? How do you do it? Uh so to be honest, uh when I was passing out, uh Coca-Cola was taking over in India from the bottler. You know the bottler, the Cobo and Fobo operations in Coke? Yeah. So uh by the way I, I should say for people listening to this I'm in the back seat of your car because I opened the door and I said should I sit in the front or back and you said back Yeah uh-huh. and I got the bottle of water beside me cuz you got a nice full bottle of water I just took a took a sip of it what kind of car is this that we're in uh, I know it's super nice and clean oh, what uh, sorry what kind of car do you have oh this is Honda Insight Honda Honda Insight Insight okay It- super nice and clean and you're telling us as you um As you got older, you got this job at Coke. How uh-huh. old were you then? So I uh, just go back 18 years ago. Yeah. So I was around 20. Okay. Yep. And uh but you're 42 now. Yeah. So you were like 24? Yep. Okay. <laughs> we're like we're both Indian. One of us we got to be able to do the math together. My dad's a math and physics teacher. Oh, is it? Someone's going to be listening and be uh, like uh 42 minus 18 yeah. is not 20. <laughs> Two Indian guys in a cab. Okay. <clears throat> in an Uber. I'm sorry. And it's not even an Uber, it's a service. Now, uh-huh. you go to Coca-Cola then what? Well, then what happened after that? So that was my journey started up where uh, I uh, in sales and marketing and business and blah blah and all those and you know uh, like in India climbing the corporate ladder 
Are you? No, you. Okay, I, the corporate yeah. Ladder. So I was almost into the corporate uh, jungle, I say. Yeah. So I started from one job to the other and then, you know, started growing in my life. So from Coca-Cola to my next uh, organization was uh, New York Life. You know New York Life? No, I don't. And so they're into life insurance business. Okay. So they were launching again in India. Uh, so India, Indian market was getting privatized. So you're helping all kinds of American companies launch oh, yeah. and build in India. Fortunately, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Uh, so I worked with Coca-Cola. Then I had a chance to work again, launch new operations for New York Life. Yeah. So this was one of a very life-changing event for me because Coke was hardcore FMCG product, yeah. right? You have to go around in the field and you know make sure the availability and the visibility of your product and make sure your market shares are going up. And you know you need to take care of service level agreements and all those stuff. Stuff manage a team of drivers around you who will go and deliver. Tons of processes. Tons of tons processes. Of rules, tons you know of how American bureaucracy. Are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, dot in the eyes, crossing the T's. Yeah, absolutely. So it was a great experience. I would still say uh, Coca Cola is one company which made me learn the most business what I know now. Yeah. So Coke was uh, fantastic, but I I was being given one. Uh, irresistible offer by New York Life guys so I had to join them that time I'm talking about year uh, maybe like early 2000 yeah Coke offered me uh, uh, look sorry New York Lock offered me like 500,000 INR like like Indian rupees what's that worth which is here? like 5 lakh rupees that time it was like I was the highest paid I You're was the highest paid in the in in, in the whole uh, Office of wow. New York Life, you know. What, that's can our, I ask what's that worth in, in Canadian, uh, in dollars Canadian or U.S. dollars right now, or in in? Well, I, I mean, I have no idea. What, is that like you're the equivalent of like a millionaire, or is it the equivalent that you're like uh, making six figures? It, it was a six figure, of of course. Wow. And okay. Six figure in you know, like 18 years ago in India was yeah. a big amount of salary. No, I believe you. I just I have no concept of the number. Yeah. So, so you're making this big job at, and at New York Life. Then what do you do after that? Uh, so New York life was a journey for me where I really, really learned uh, the, the most important part of sales, which is known as direct sales, mm -hmm. where I learned people skills. Because yeah. Coke is not what you, it's a B2B thing. Coke is a B2B thing, right? But New York life being a life insurance company, you need to get yourself into B2C aspects of life. There I learned how to uh, effectively deal with people. You learned at because you're selling insurance. Yes. So, so you're writing people's business. So of yeah. course you're talking to people. Exactly. My job How long was, were you there? I was there for three and a half, four years. Wow. So yeah. now you're like either 25 or 35, but depending on our math, we have no idea how old yeah, you are. Yeah, exactly. Which I, which we can calculate anytime. I'm driving right now. <laughs> no, no, I know. You're taking me to the airport. I just don't know what to type in. So I'm going to the airport and then I guess back. So now, um, take me after after New York Life. Then what? What'd you do? New York Life. Then. Uh, like letter you said, yeah, so well, I, I, I wanted to go ahead in life uh -huh. and then a few friends of uh, uh, you know mine, they were planning to move from India to Middle East, like going to Dubai. Right. So, but they had no clue how to do it. Right. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll take the lead and then we plan how to land Dubai project. Wow. It's really dramatic, right? Yeah. But it actually happened. Wow. So three of us really planned uh, project Dubai. And we we've given a deadline to it because we uh, we ha we we were supposed to work in a in a very uh, organized way, right? So we kept a 90-day deadline to get a job in Dubai and land in Dubai. Really? Yeah. You so have, that's what you know. Seth Godin, um, marketing guru, best-selling author, and I, I have a story about you, which uh -huh. I talked to him about. It's, it's going to loop back. He says, you know, you always have to just come up with your date. Come up with the date you're going to ship before you start the project and then work backwards. You guys did the exact same thing with Project Oh, yeah. Dubai. Without that, nothing can be possible. Yeah. You, yeah. you know that, right? Goal yeah. setting, I right? Mean, yeah, so I goal, guess I do, but keep yeah. going. <laughs> like we, we all say, goal setting, goal setting. I haven't launched smart. this podcast yet. I'm just recording with you and, and then I'm going to launch this later. So uh -huh. if you ask me when I'm going to launch it, I don't know, but maybe that's why I haven't done it. So you're teaching me stuff. So keep going. Oh, perfect. Okay. So we, we planned some, something like, we were having new uh, websites coming up in India about job uh, and all those, you know, how to get published, uh, get looked around jobs for, you know, in Dubai and all. So we did a lot of exercise finding jobs on the website, you know, and then we made a list, exhaustive list of all the jobs and vacancies we found. Fortunately, most of the employees, those who uh, publish jobs on Dubai jobs in India, they are in Delhi or Mumbai. Right. So 
we just made like 200 300 jobs in as a list wow yeah and then we sorted out which are the major uh, job uh, listing agencies or the placement companies yeah and then we picked up the phones and we started calling randomly to each 200 300 vacancies wow. right so we knew we are working on a law of large number yeah. you know so after uh, having 2 300 uh, telephone person who takes the yeah, most we, shots thinks the most exactly, baskets exactly exactly so we nailed down nailed down there was a funnel we finally got four only four people those who invited us yeah. to come to delhi wow so with this four people we ran wow so this we did this activity for twice and thrice in span of 3 weeks yeah so the fourth week one of our friend he got through with one of the automobile company yeah and then rest of all we t- we were three who planned together then two of us we just made him like no you got to speak to your hr manager sell our profiles to him at least get us 5 minutes to meet him and all those it was all filmy you know yeah and finally his name was sachin sachin could manage to get us a gate in yeah i was the first man to go and meet the hr manager <laughs> yeah and he said wish you know sachin is from automobile before max new york life you were with selling bottles yeah i don't think i can give you a chance to sell cars in dubai right you can sell a coke you can't sell a car exactly right so then what did you say then the entire 5 minute interview was a turning point and guess what i was hired how'd you do it i just 5 minutes i just spoke to him i said no mba in this world teaches how to sell a particular product they only teach you how to sell Mm. And I know how to sell. Give me a chance. Yeah. That's it. You know what's funny is you said they don't teach you how to sell a particular product, they teach you how to sell. You pull up a level. You know, I think about animals. They say kingdom phylum class. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not necessarily um a koala bear. It is a marsupial. It's not necessarily a marsupial, it's a mammal. Uh-huh. You do the same thing about Uber, okay? You uh-huh. say it's not a taxi, it's not a driver, it's a service. You yes. have the skill, I'm hearing in you, to pull up a level mm-hmm. and see what the macro thing is, which you know, I got I got your three books on my lap. I cannot wait to dive into them. Wow. Now, don't 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 kind of I want you to keep going, but I also want to say, you know, your first book is written by an Indian man. It's by Shiv Kara. Here's your first book. It's called You Can Win. Mm-hmm. A step-by-step tool mm-hmm. for top achievers. The cover says over 3.3 million copies sold. This is the blueprint for turning your vision into action. Mm-hmm. According to the bo- the back of the book, it, this book will help you build confidence, master the steps of positive thinking, be successful by turning weaknesses into strengths, gain credibility by doing the right things for the right reasons. This book is called You Can Win by Shiv Kara. Did yeah. I say his last name right? Kara yeah, K H E R A. Yep. Now yeah. keep going with your story and if you can tell us like, you know, you've got this big book you have that you call this your bible or one of your you know one of your bibles yeah. and you now go to dubai yeah okay tell us how cuz you got the positive thinking down uh-huh. you've got the so you can sell yourself in 5 minutes we're slowing down here cuz we're beside right behind a cement mixer with its four ways on yeah we're getting honked at but it's not us it's the cement mixer people okay you know you're a 4.99 when you uh evade the cement mixer while doing an interview on a turnpike on the highway <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> now keep keep going with the story uh-huh so dubai uh, we three uh, planned and out of uh, all three we all three went there so w- the third guy got the job too the third guy then it was my job to convince the hr Eventually, manager you put the hr manager in a yeah. headlock or something yeah yeah exactly <laughs> no i <laughs> so we were both uh, given a chance so when he was convinced with my theory he said okay i don't mind giving a chance to you and uh, with the same theory with the same heat probably with the same enthusiasm uh, my other, another friend whose name is swapnesh swapnesh also got a chance wow. uh, to be able to do this uh, what do you call pilot project for this hr manager and can i assume that you guys are all three single at the time we all three were married you're all married <laughs> yes. not even part of the story okay so you all have significant others you all have partners yes we have partners and then partners. the partners are up for going to dubai yes okay, okay. Yeah. so so the six of you go to dubai yes okay keep going so dubai unfortunately doesn't allow your spouse to join you so we were only given our own work permits Dubai don't allow you to immigrate like uh, the Canada or any other country. Uh, okay. You only get a work permit, so we only three were allowed. And the plan was like, we three will land first, we'll set up the job, we'll find out the residence, blah blah blah, and then we'll probably call our wives there. 
Okay. So this was our plan. Right. So three of us landed. Fortunately, unfortunately, we three all were given different locations mm -hmm. as soon as we landed. Yeah. So we are now by ourselves, right? Right. So I landed in the city of Muscat initially, which is uh, next to Dubai. Or, or, Dubai is basically part of UAE. UAE is joining with Oman. Oman has the capital of Muscat. I was uh, land. I, we landed in Dubai, but I was given a charge to work in Muscat city. Right. Mus Muscat is one of the cleanest city in the world. Okay. So uh, my job was to get the training done first, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. all about Toyota because it's a Toyota. Uh, the company is known as South Bowen, and I was supposed to sell Toyota cars. Right. And it was not again. Uh, Did you say Toyota or Toda? Toyota. Toyota. Okay, yeah. sorry. And it was again uh, uh, a B two B concept, right? Yep. I was supposed to sell. You're to, selling cars. Yes, to the to the dealers. You're selling cokes. You're selling life insurance. You're selling cars. <laughs> you are selling. <laughs> So a sales guy is always a sales How guy. How long right? did you do this job? Six months. Then what happened? I was sick. I was sick of not able to call my wife because they were not processing. They were not processing my family visa thing. Mm -hmm. So that there was this was a problem, Ryan. Of course, yeah. Yeah. So then I called up my wife. Said, you know, what is supposed to be done? Then she said, Look, you, uh, we can't stay alone here, and you know how it happens, right? So then I was, oh, I, did I take a wrong exit? No, you're good. No, I think I took a wrong exit. Well, I don't care. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really going to the airport. I just want to hang out with you. And All I figured right, hailing okay. you was the best way to do it. <laughs> so uh, then we planned like, okay, let me, because uh, uh, my, my last job, my relationship, my performance, everything was uh, really, really, because my boss didn't let me go last time from Max when I resigned. He just came on his nerves. He's saying, no, I won't let you leave this job. I want you here. Yeah. I said, boss, look, I'm getting a career. And then we went, he, he went into a hard discussion and he said, I'll come to the airport. I'll have your flight canceled. I'll not let you go. I want you here. You don't understand your worth, what you can do in life insurance. Right. You are going for a false job and all those things. So this those, is this life insurance guy. Yeah. They're this, now the people are fighting over you. Yeah, so now you want to quit the Dubai job. Yeah, exactly. But then the insurance guy wants you back. He he, he wanted me back right before. But how did you? Can I just ask? I'm not trying to jump too forward ahead, but like, how do we get from here to Canada? Canada, oh. or I'm sitting in a car in Canada. Canada is a long journey. But I, how did you get from there? To, why did you come here? I went to England before. Oh my gosh! So, you, so after Dubai, yeah. I went to uh, India again. Got picked up your wife. Picked up no, I, I I picked up my job which I was doing. Okay, picked up your job, but you're back with your wife. <laughs> yeah, I was back with my no wife. No kids. Just after I, I was uh -huh. back, we were blessed like in a year with a baby. Okay, the yeah, timing daughter, was yes. not coincidental. Yeah, exactly. You came back, boom, I, there's the kid. Yeah, no, okay. I mean like. Uh, uh, so this was. But also, to tell me about the book. You told me that this book you can win. Uh -huh. Shiv Kara was one of the most formative books of your life. Oh, books. Believe me, Neil, yeah. without books, you will take at least 200 years of life to learn something in life. Right. Because books are the extract of uh, life, you know. So before you, if somebody has born in this world and he's gone through some experiences, he's just written in the books. So it's. Be I have two choices, either go with the experiences of people or create my own experience. Right. It'll take me a long time to create my own experience and then create a book about myself. How about reading a book which is already already an extract of two, three hundred, four hundred years of experience in it? So that's it's how a quick, I, fast way to learn. Yeah, that's how I, I But how do you know which books to pick? So Ha, interesting question. I will appreciate this for you. Good question. So when I was back in India, someone took me to a business seminar. I never used to read any any kind of books other than textbooks before that. <laughs> you sound like uh, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing at my own Indian parents when I would come home uh -huh. from school and they'd be like, oh, here's the, you should read the next year math textbook. So all you read was textbooks. Okay, you sound a bit like my dad. Keep going. Exactly. Yeah. So this man of, uh, uh, the, the, friend of my one of my brother-in-laws he wanted to pull both of us into a business and for that business he took us to one of the seminars i'm sure you do uh, you may be knowing about brit worldwide what's it called brit worldwide b r i t yeah b r i t t brit okay. worldwide mm -hmm. so no, they, I don't know. they have going. a circuit they have yeah. they actually help amway 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 to build their business okay they're like help they're training salespeople. 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. So basically, so you went to a sales conference. Sales conference. Basically, it was uh, uh, the conference was basically to market about the concept of uh, Amway to to be able to uh, uh, you know make people join the Amway as an opportunity. Right. So I was one of them. So, yeah. but more than Amway, the thing which attracted me was the education system there. Right. They have one of the best education system I have ever never been to in my life till now. So, but how? Do, where's the books come in? So they they have an education system. Yeah. In which they propose you so many books to be read. Ah, I see. There's the homework. So that was there was a place someone mentioned about Chef Keda ah, and Canada. Ah. Oh. So Chef Keda lived in Canada too. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he was. So he turned out to be an author, being in Canada only. He. While he was selling life insurance in Canada, he turned out to be an author here itself. Wow! So that's where Shiv Kedar started. And that's where you got there. the book from. That's where I got that book. You, you got the book from like an Amway seminar. Amway seminar. Okay. And that's where I read uh, this first book, uh, "You Can Win." Right. And I, I really realized I never read anything like that before. What, what do you mean? Like self-helping books, positive mm-hmm. mental attitude books. Because you know, in corporate world, you. You you read a different stuff, right? Yeah. The life insurance was something else, and that's uh, getting into Brit uh, worldwide seminar and reading a Shiv, Shiv Kera book and working on life insurance domain has clicked my life into a different domain all put together. Mm-hmm. All right. Then I started. It was so interesting. You I see started, yourself differently. I started applying all those knowledge of Brit worldwide in my job, not in MV business. Oh, interesting. You stole their education and just used it for yourself. Yeah, exactly. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is—I mean, you have a 4.99 rating with 5,000 rides. You're doing something right. So, can you just do me a little jump? Because I want to come back to your story in detail later. I do. Uh huh. But I just do me a little jump. You read this book. You're at this seminar. Uh huh. Can you do me a flash forward to can- come in here? How did you end up in an Uber in Canada? With because the first time I talked to you, the first time I I hailed you, the first time you told me you were an executive at a telecommunications firm. Oh, there was a job before I uh, came here. I I, I was with uh, a leading telecom company of India known as Tata Tele Services. Vish, you realize that most people would say that what you're doing now is is a step down uh-huh. from what you did. Uh huh. But you don't see it that way. You Why? told me. I, I mean, when I asked you, you uh-huh. told me that. Is that right? Uh, I think most important in uh, life is to enjoy what you're doing. If I, I think I'm able to enjoy what I'm doing. If I, uh, I think I'm, and and top of it, Uber doing Uber was not my first choice. Not for uh, doing Uber, I plan to come down to Canada. Mm-hmm. So uh, I won't say Uber is my first choice uh, or my plan to be coming to uh, you know do something in Canada, because uh, unfortunately. Uh, Canadian employees, they don't recognize yeah. uh, international education, uh, international experience. It's or, horrible. It's the classic, you know, your taxi driver is a cardiologist and, you know, the, the guy helping sweep the floors at your kid's school is, uh, a, you know, an electrical engineer from Pakistan. Yeah, so like that, it, these are the it, stories we all hear. Exactly. So that thing, I, I'm no new, right? I'm mm-hmm. the same face coming one more immigrant into this country. I mean, my dad's, you know, uh, brother was an architect from India and his uh, you know the best job he could find was was working in a call center mm-hmm. and he couldn't really make ends meet and he went back to India to be an architect I mean it's hard to do what you do and and can I also say Vish huh. that you were the hardest interview I've ever had to schedule is it C- because every day da- every time oh, I yeah, was like I, I texted of, you and yeah. I was like hey can you meet today you're like you know I'm working how many hours a day are you working as an uber driver I, I, I to be honest uh, uh, it's not the hours which make us to which make yeah. me work. I chase my target for the day. Like we don't get paid hourly with Uber, right? We have to yeah. uh, chase the rides, complete but them. Every and time I text or call you, yeah. you're working. Because I start as early as like seven thirty, eight in the morning. Uh huh. And now and it's keep, nine, almost nine o'clock at night right now. So that's how it's my typical day. Seven days a week? Almost six days a week. Oh my god. Sometimes if I'm lagging behind my target, I go for a half a day on Sunday also. And you, when you say target, are you talking? You don't have to tell me the numbers, but you're talking target by dollars. Is dollars, you, yeah. Because oh, okay. you know, so I have bills. Seven thirty in the morning to nine p.m. at night. A twelve, fourteen hour day, six days a week. Okay, here's the math stuff again. But you're talking like an eighty to hundred hour week. 
it happens sometimes. It and happens, yeah. despite that, you're maintaining a 4.99. Like you're still, you're the best Uber driver in the world, as far as I can tell. Is it? I think. Well, I, I can we, you as you said, there's no leaderboard, but like. I, 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 when we put this show out, uh -huh. I'm going to say, send me any rating as high or higher than 4.99 with around 5,000 rides. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling no one will have that. And it's amazing. So I, I know we have skipped a few parts of your story, and we're going to come back to them. Yep, yep. But you, from You Can Win by Shiv Caro, the next book you recommended, uh -huh. and pretty soon, by the way, I'm going to change the address because we're getting to the airport. Uh -huh. So let me just, you know what, let me change the address. Let's take us down to the CN Tower. Uh -huh. You know, there's the Drake album, Views. You know, on the front of views, on the front of views, he uh, <clears throat> he's sitting on the CN Tower. So why don't we change to uh, to go to the CN Tower? Sure. Um, here we go. I'm just gonna change the the address. I know we're at the airport now. For anyone that's listening from Toronto, you're gonna laugh that we're driving to the airport and to the city. Okay, update, update. Let's hear if you get the funny bell. I got it. You got it? Yeah. Okay, it didn't ring a funny... I thought it was going to go like a funny ring. Yeah, it, it usually goes like oh, that. Oh, but we turned off the sound, of course. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going suddenly to the Sea Tower. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you said your second book here. I want to reveal your second book now. Uh -huh. And here I am, by the way. I'm crouched in the back seat of, of, the, of the, the Honda... Insight. Insight. I yeah. got my bottle of water. I got my microphone. Uh -huh. And the next book you, you told me was formative to you. Uh-huh was The Magic of Thinking Big. Wow, that's a book. By uh, David J. Schwartz. Uh -huh. It says, six million copies sold. Uh -huh. The subtitle is Acquire the Secrets of Success, Achieve Everything You've Always Wanted, Personal Property, Financial Security, Power and Influence, The Ideal Job, Satisfying Relationships, A Rewarding and Enjoyable Life. The Magic of Thinking Big. This book was published back in 1959. I recently saw the movie The Shape of Water. Uh -huh. it, you know, it takes place kind of in the sort of Cold War era, and, and the, one of the characters is reading this book. Is it? In the movie. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So the back of it says, more than six million readers around the world have improved their lives through the lessons of the magic of thinking big. Uh -huh. The teachings of David Schwartz, long regarded as one of the foremost experts on motivation, will help you work better, manage better, earn more money, and most important of all, live better finding greater happiness and peace of mind. The Magic of Thinking Big contains the secrets to getting the most out of your job, your marriage, and your family life, and your community. David Schwartz was a professor at Georgia State University in Atlanta and president of Creative Educational Services, a consulting firm specializing in leadership development. Well, this sounds like an interesting book, The Magic of Thinking Big. So could you continue your story <laughs> and drive a car <laughs> while also... Oh, I, I, are we going the... I'm no, sorry, I, we went I, I, to took, do, I took we, you the wrong it's way. It's an airport. I, uh, yeah, you're doing an airport turnaround yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I know I want to be safe here. I don't want to distract you too much. But what I'm going to ask you to do, Vish, is because is, here's where we are in the story. I know we're sitting in Canada now. You've taken us in your journey up to being married, uh -huh. having having a child. You didn't say if it was a boy or a girl. 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 Yeah. And... Um, you, you mentioned that you're back in India. You also mentioned that England's coming and Canada's coming. Uh -huh. And I'd like you to sort of loop in, if you don't uh -huh. mind, the magic of thinking big. Tell oh, us wow. about your relationship. I was so desperate to come on that. Tell us about your relationship with the magic of thinking big. So magic of thinking big is a great book. It's, it's, it's such a great book. It really creates a magic. It really creates a magic. So after going through that book, it gives me a new, it gave me a new idea about really really how to think and and I still remember uh, a seminar which we attended lately in uh, Brit Worldwide which where one of the leaders was saying you know uh, the more you read the more you refine your thought process right so it was all about refining the thought process I started reading more and more books that's a great quote. The more you read, the more you refine your thought process. Yeah, this is how it is. The books were the best friends for me that time. I started reading more and more books. And You're in your late 20s, early 30s here? Yeah, yeah. Mid-20s right? mid and, okay. uh, yeah, you know, late 20s. So books actually helped me everywhere then, uh, you know, because... What did you get out of this book? Uh, sorry? What did you get out of this so, book? Uh, yeah. So many things. The most important thing, was, which I still remember, this book gave me a formula in life always formula of yes man and no man you know he explains about a, uh, the human brain is like a 
thought of factories, you know. And in this factory, there are two foremen who work. One is a no man, and the other is yes man. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in given every task or every thought, whatever we have in our mind, mm -hmm. it depends uh, the output. Uh, the output depend, depends on the job given to yes man or no man. So it's it's very magical. If you give the job to a no man, your own mind will start finding logics and regions reasons to finally prove that yes how can't you do this job so finally you become negative about this aspect right but on the contrary is, you, a, is a no man someone who says no a lot a no it's just it's, he's just a no man he's just he'll say no 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 for everything uh, and the yes man says yes to yes, everything yes everything okay so you know keep so, going yeah you know debate competition how yeah. debate competitions yes. are so it's it's like one of the debate competition we do a person who is speaking in favor he also looks quite right a person who is speaking in uh, uh, against he also has valid reasons and valid logics so at a time you feel both are correct mm -hmm. the same thing he it's like any you know any presidential debate or politician debate and uh, you know, classic scene in any movie in the courtroom. You're like, you agree with both sides of the Absolutely, argument. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Because both are logical, right? right? Because human mind, we go with logics, right? So uh, he explained, if it is uh, both way correct, right? And if giving it to no no man, you're getting into a negative side, or you're eventually losing the task. Why not to give it to yes man? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thought your brain will work and give you reasons towards it. That was the most most important thought, which has changed all my life afterwards. What did you do differently? So I started working on my Yes Man. That's why I do in Uber as well now. Yeah. So Yes Man is like, I, I, I know I'm doing a service, right? Yeah. So if my rider wants a little small thing, which maybe like giving a direction how to change his route. Yeah. So I don't mind. It's fine. He's paying for the ride. He has some right over the ride, uh, le oh, the road, where to go, how to go. What else do you do for riders? What else do you do for people in their car so that I, most Uber drivers don't do? Uh, well, uh, to be honest, I don't know really about the other Uber drivers. Right. But I, I just try to. What are some I, other things you do for people? I, I first of all forget where I come come from. I have to uh, play a role of Uber driver right now, so I just try to be in car to play the Uber driver role. Because mm. I think a lot of guys may be uh, doing it part time or at the side, yeah. so they are still under the hat of their daytime job or whatever. Right. So they 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 don't realize the value of their job, and probably you know they are just doing it at the side, so they don't have the value of. Uh, really giving the right service at the place. I mean, I notice I get in your car, you got no music playing, and I always, I'm, I feel weird saying this, I got a 4.72 rating, okay? Uh -huh. I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh -huh. It's probably bad, isn't it? 4.72 is not as bad. Okay, well, I'm worried, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm a 4.72, but I always say, excuse me, could you turn off the radio? That's uh -huh. the first thing I say. So the first thing I say when I get in the Uber is, excuse me, could you turn off the radio? And sometimes if I feel bad, I say, I gotta make a phone call. But uh -huh. really, I just don't wanna listen to like, whatever that random music is. I kind of want to think about something or, uh -huh. you know, so read I don't, myself I, I don't keep my radio on at home. I could, that's why that's I'm saying. That. You're, the, you're the only one I know that does that. And also, there's no smell in your car. Okay. And, and, and most cars have a smell. I'm not saying it's a good smell or a bad smell, uh -huh. but most cars have a smell. They have like a, they have like a little pine tree hanging down or like some dude sprayed himself with ax. Uh -huh. I've smelled weed in a car before. Like there is odors in cars and your car is like, perfect it's like i don't know how you do that because you have so many drivers but oh so many passengers so this i think this is my uh, this car is my office right yeah this is the only office i have in this business so i'm supposed to keep it up i'm supposed to maintain it i'm supposed to clean it every day when i go home i take out the carpets i clean them if it is snowing they're dirty i clean them i wash them every day i dry them up i decked up my car in the night itself so that i have no time to waste in the morning and i start my work like this i fill up my gas tank i do everything about cleaning in the car at the night so i clean it every day when i finish my job how long does that take you 15 minutes and you pull out all the carpets, you vacuum exactly. them? Exactly. Not vacuum. You, it's not that dirty if you clean it every day. But I mean, you know, it's Toronto. You have snow, you have slush, you have mm -hmm. dirt, you have people so once, spill stuff in your car. Yeah, then what yeah. do you do? Once in a week, I, I do the um, uh, air blow inside the car and pick it up through vacuum. Yeah. Otherwise, every day if you keep your uh, floor mats clean, you know, mm -hmm. use a wipe off things, everything. Uh, if you do it every day, then you really don't need to do even weekly the vacuum thing. You know what's interesting is, is that, that phrase, if you do it, every day 
because I once flew to Abu Dhabi to bring it back to United Arab Emirates. I was um, invited to give a speech over there to uh, the royal family, uh-huh. and they flew me out there. And they flew me out there. I've never flown before. You know, it's um, Etihad Airlines, Etihad, and yeah. it's like business class. Uh-huh. So I was like, the the plane, the flight alone was like kind of like a luxurious oh, thing. Oh yes, yeah. And you know what I noticed? They have someone clean the bathroom after every time mm-hmm. that a passenger goes in. So on a normal flight, if it's like a five hour flight, by the end of, the, if you want to go to the bathroom on, right near the end of the flight, the bathroom's a pigsty. There's spills, there's pee all over the floor. It's like they're out of paper towels. It's like a terrible bathroom. Mm-hmm. But on this airline, it was like a 12, 14 hour flight. It was pristine. And you know what I thought to myself? I remember mm-hmm. talking to, I hearing an interview with the guy who opened the Sky Dome. Uh-huh. which is, you know, the big, uh, where the Blue Jays play. Uh-huh. And he said, if we keep it clean every day, uh-huh. nobody will trash it. And I remember talking to John MacArthur, the former dean of Harvard Business School. Uh-huh. He said, if we have people clean it every day, uh-huh. nobody will throw garbage on the ground. Absolutely and right. when I see a guy at a bathroom in the airport, standing, uh-huh. or sorry, on the airplane, standing in front of the bathroom, you know what I do? Uh-huh. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty careful about where I aim. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I, I, I make sure I don't leave paper towels. Cause I'm like, there's a guy right outside whose job is to clean it. Oh, so my. I'm a more respectful bathroom goer because of the consistency of the cleanliness. Yes, absolutely. So you, by cleaning your car every day, I get in your car, it's clean. Well, I'm it's not, not going to trash the car. You know, you know Neil, uh, not just every day. You know, no one cares how many rides you've done uh, in this car before. For them, it is the first ride because they are taking wow. it first. So you're supposed to give him the, the experience of, no, this is the car, this is the first ride of this car and you are getting in the car and car is supposed to be clean. In winter time, I don't know whether other drivers do it or you will believe it or not. I keep a wet napkin in my car, yeah. right under my seat. After every ride, I pull over quickly, safely on the side. I clean the rubber mats quickly, all the rubber mats behind. Yeah. And then I wipe up my napkin and keep back in that poly bag. Oh my gosh. So as fish. soon as my next rider comes in, he finds the car is just, just made for him from the showroom right now you are getting five stars not just for service like your personality your conversation your cleanliness like you are nailing it on every circumstance it's incredible and you know what for people that are listening to this that don't live in toronto or don't live in a snowy city when we go through that every single store is covered in dirt and slush and yep. snow so yep. not only are you spotless you appear so different than everywhere else. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's I had no idea how to handle with this because when I started Ubering before, every second rider coming into the car, and I uh, initially I thought, let me tell them if they can, you know, shred the snow off their shoes. But mm. after a couple of uh, times, I realized they were getting irritated. Yeah. So I thought, no, let's not talk to them and tell anything to do. Let me see what I can do for it. So I found out this reason, like this uh, solution to clean the mat myself, right? Yeah. Because every time when I say them to shred the snow, once or twice they're okay, but I started uh, realizing they're getting irritated. Yeah, and you don't want to irritate them. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to antagonize the customer in any way. Of course, because I was I, I gave a commitment to myself. If I'm doing even Uber, I'm gonna do it best. Yeah. So now whatever takes it, I am going to have a rating, which is really, so this is not by fluke, this rating, this is well planned. Mm -hmm. This is driven through a lot of efforts. This is driven through a lot of uh, initiatives. And this is basically a well planned thing. And I think uh, uh, that you've been thinking big, as you said, the magic of thinking big. I was supposed to actually do something if, because if I, for for Mm -hmm. my other, other, fellows like my uh, family members or my colleagues or my friends whosoever knows I'm in Canada I can't even share it with them because in, in, back home in my country they will uh, think it in a different way they will not uh, understand Uber doing Uber is a small or big they'll say oh you are you driving cabs there what are you doing man you went uh, immigrated from India from a general manager job and you're driving cabs there what a bullshit you're doing with your life. Mm. So I thought, no, if I'm doing Uber even, I'm going to do it best. So what do you tell your family? Now I tell them. No, but I'm, what did you, back home when you started this job, you said, not that you didn't say you were embarrassed, but you also said you didn't feel comfortable telling them. I, well, I had uh, another survival job in, 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 in Courtyard Marriott in Brampton. So yeah. I was working in the night audit team there. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, you told I, them that job. Yeah, my job sort of thing in the hotel and all those things. Wow. I, so you then, I'm sensing from you, you have become comfortable telling them that you do. Not yet. Oh, not you yet. haven't. Not yet. Not yet. Are you? And don't don't feel like we need to talk about this. So don't. I'm not pressuring you, but are you comfortable? But I started. I yeah. started selecting a few friends now to whom I can sh- share this. Mm. So I've started telling a few of them now, Vish, one after the can other. Can I just tell you something, man? Yeah. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You are one of the most impressive people I've met. You are so enigmatic. Your energy, I hope people can hear it. Your energy is astounding. Your personality is so uplifting. You are always smiling. So You thanks. filled me with so much energy on just a five minute drive home to my house. So nice of you, Neil. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but you are amazing. You are amazing I'm curious for you uh-huh. I think this is you're doing so well you're doing 4.99 five almost 5,000 rides mm-hmm. but you're dropping 16 hours a day seven days a week what do you want to do next is this a stepstone job for you are you planning to stay in uber for a long time would you like to work up the ladder in uber I mean I think the uber people when they hear this I think they're gonna be all over you I think you should be training uber drivers uh, I don't think uber uber really cares about any such driving driving ratings I, I don't I don't see Uber really uh, Uber never even acknowledged me for this reading. Hmm. I don't see any leaderboard, any board, anything where Uber really care about any high rating drivers even. Do you want them to care? Not really. If they say well, the, on, the, on the other side they are one of the highest high tech technology driven company, they should know this by their systems. They probably do. So what are they doing about it? They don't encourage me, you know, to keep up this rating or go do better or something. Interesting. They don't have any mechanism where I was really being, uh, you know, encouraged by Uber to set up this kind of rating. No. Yet. This was my own initiative. I know, but I, I, I'm answering the word yet, because what we don't know, neither of us, is what they are trying to do, what they're hoping to do, what they want to do. It sounds like you think, and I think this too as a bit of as a customer, is like, yeah, I see the rating, but I don't care. I mean, if the, if the driver is 4.4, uh-huh. which is pretty low, uh-huh. I still get in the car. I still get in the car, mm-hmm. which means the 4.4 driver does not lose business. And that means the 4.99 driver, which is you, does uh-huh. not gain extra business. Nothing, nothing. So then why, what motivates you? You will not even believe uh, this afternoon I was at the Uber office. Because okay. last three days I realized uh, I was losing business because I was, I was not getting enough uh, pings. Yeah. And when I speak, uh, when I spoke to a couple, couple of my fellow drivers who are doing Uber, they said we are all said we are getting enough business. They are getting enough business. They were getting enough business. And you weren't. And I weren't. So, so what? I, what so you I do? thought, let me go to Uber office and check with them. Is, is there something wrong with them, with my ID or something? So you just drove to the Uber office. I just drove to the Uber office. Okay. In, wow. In the Liberty Village. Wow. Okay. And uh, I thought, let me check with them. Does this rating matters for them or not? So I talked to the, the one of the Uber expert there about you know this problem of mine and all. So uh, I told him you know what I'm doing from last one year and so this Uber business and almost five thousand rides I've done and this is what I'm facing. So I don't know what kind of a setup they have at the Uber. He started talking to me as if I'm a newly joined driver, because huh. he himself was like a one month old employee. Right. So he started t- uh, telling me all the basics about Uber driver. I said, dude. You see my profile, right? And I'm doing Uber last one and a half years, and you see my number of rides and ratings and compliment. I know entire things about Uber as a driving, more than what you, anybody here in the Toronto would know. I can train any any Uber employee, forget about drivers. I'm a corporate guy, yeah. right? I understand business, right? right? Yeah. So then More than understand, I think you're teaching people a lot about business, exactly. including me and everybody <laughs> listening. So Keep he, going, yeah. So he, he was like, Oh, you know what? Okay, let's see. You are getting the rights or not rights? I said, okay. So he he picked up his phone. He tried to match my ID with his ID, like a rider ID with a driver ID. Okay. He tried to hail you on hail his app. Hail me exactly. Okay. And I obviously we did it smartly. So I got picked up. Yeah. Then he said, look, you're getting it. I said, my problem is not this. I said I'm getting lower pings, lower yeah, business. Yeah, the, the frequency is declining. So Whereas then, you would think someone with a higher rating would get more. It took me a while to more. make him understand. Oh my gosh. And you know what? I'm driving this Honda, which is a 2010 model. Right. I made all my business on this car, which is 
expiring in next 8 days how many kilometers you got on this thing it, oh it has almost 244000 wow right so yeah. this is a, a old car right, right. It, i bought it for $7000 when i landed in canada which is what year which is in 2015 okay you got here 3 years ago or yeah. less than 3 years ago yeah. and you tell him this then what happens with this guy so this guy he then he told me hey look your car is 2010 so uh, that's the reason you're not getting pings i said come on 2010 i know it is an expiring car uber doesn't have a permission to allow as per the city norms to be able to drive any car more than 7 years so if i told you i'm getting rights and if you just tested my id if i'm getting right how come that 7 years old rule is applicable right now i still have 8 days left with me because city has given 3 month permission to extend the car and i just have this car oh so you knew the rules a bit better than him it sounds oh, of like of course yeah. that's what i told him yeah. I, so he said oh then i said go back my query was not like i'm not getting pings at all i'm getting so this is how uber staff is really really disappointing i said okay fine i'm keeping my app online i'm going to talk to you only as as long as i'm not getting the next ping because i don't want to waste my time right time is literally yeah. costing you so money that's why i hailed you because i'm like the, the only way i can beat you for this drive is i'm like <laughs> i got to call you to get a ride to the airport and so i made my app online yeah. and i told him as long as i'm not getting my next ride i'm talking to you and once i get my next ride i leave and how long were you there about 10 15 minutes oh my gosh took yeah. that long yeah. even though people in toronto you know it's 5 million people living in this city oh no this is so dead city right in north america you and, right. and you're the num- i i i mean i i tell you how frequently i take it you're probably the number one rated guy like it's you should be getting fed the most business the most lucrative trips the longest drives the at least i should not be punished, punished. Oh, at least gosh. I should I want to be a normal driver I should get normal business and I see when my other friends who are at 479 480 488 yeah. they're getting back to back trips and I am riding in the core downtown core you know Adelaide yeah. you know Queen Street King Street all the way going yeah. coming around in last 1 hour half hour that's usually hour. where I hail an Uber and it's like I press the button and the guy's right there exactly like it's like I don't there's no it's like the driver's <laughs> waiting for me it's like crazy so no. I was so sick last 3 days you know oh I'm so Typically sorry it was happening and i was so lost i said no i'm losing business and there was one more thing uber has given us a quest because there's a lot of competition going on right now with yeah. lift here yeah. so uber wants drivers to be locked for a month or for a week so they've given a target trips like if you do x number of trips you'll get uh, a overriding commission of right. like 500 dollars six so i was already caught in one of the targets to do for uber and you're not giving me trips yeah So and how do you pass the threshold? Exactly. So I uh, my my biggest So question, how does this net out? I mean, there we've talked about the you know, some of these stories you're mentioning, you're sharing with us on a personal level, but we've heard them in the newspapers, we've read about them. You know, there's been a lot about Uber in the press. So how does this manifest itself? I'm talking to you. You are an incredible Uber Uber service man. You know, not not a dryer. You're you're getting the service business as you said, and you're feeling frustration. So what's next? How do what what happens after this for you? Uh, after uber you mean no i don't mean after uber i mean what happens? well to be yeah to, uh, well this is my experience with uber o- over this last one year they uh, they i don't i won't say they don't don't care yeah they don't have time yeah they are growing to the size which they never never expected right so they they don't it's have it's not a, it's not a problem of dislike it's more just it's hyper growth leads hyper to growth, exactly like leads to some mistakes and problems which are overwhelmed by the growth exactly like like the movie hulk if you can recall which movie the, there was a movie hulk 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 yeah so there was a failure of scientific uh, uh, testing or invention right right and uh, after a while nobody could control that guy he went into that size right yeah so i think something is happening uber's uh, turning into the hulk yeah probably i won't say that smash. word yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but and, and you know we're talking about uber and, and i appreciate you opening this up because it's a sense of discussion we know the people from uber obviously will listen to this and and and, and that's not but it's not a, it's not a shot at them because what we're trying to do is help them become better yep that's Well, I worked at Walmart for 10 years. When I started at Walmart, uh-huh. it was one of the most vilified companies in the world. Uh-huh. Number one company in the world, people hated it. They petitioned it. They killed small business. I was inside of it. Uh-huh. And just like people that right now are listening that might work for a big airline company or might work for a big oil company or might work for a big, you know, uh 
insurance company. People sometimes dislike those companies, but the spirit of conversation that we are having is is like the magic of thinking big. Uh -huh. Okay, it's how do we make it better? How do we improve it? You have bought into the magic of thinking. The first chapter of Magic of Thinking Big talks about the mindset. Yeah, it's all about how do you think big. Yes. You, you would. It sounds like this is one of the books you'd recommend they read. Oh yes, for everyone, or everyone on this planet should read this book. And and can I just push you? Now we're going to go to the third book. Uh -huh. And as we talked about the third book, it's called "Who Moved My Cheese," by Dr. Spencer Johnson. It's an amazing way to deal with change in your work and in your life. It's a very slender book. Uh, a lot of people will have heard of this book. It's only 95 pages. The font looks like it's about 20 point font with pictures in it. Over 24 million copies sold. Written for all ages, this story takes less than an hour to read, but its unique insights can last for a lifetime. Who Moved My Cheese is a simple parable that reveals profound truths. It's an amusing and enlightening story of four characters who live in a maze and look for cheese to nourish them and make them happy. Cheese is a metaphor for what you want in life, whether it's a good job, a loving relationship, money, a possession, a 5.0 Uber rating, or a company that respects you. <laughs> and the maze is where you look for what you want, the organization you work in, or the family or community you live in. This profound book from Dr. Spencer Johnson will show you how to anticipate change, adapt quickly, and enjoy. Now, I don't know if you know this, Vish, uh -huh. but two things. Number one, um, this book was written, I want to get the copyright here so we can uh, take a look at it. It's published by Vermillion in London. Um, uh, first published in 1998, 1998. Mm -hmm. with 24 million copies sold. And Dr. Spencer Johnson just passed away. Oh, I don't know about this. Yeah, Sorry. just a few months ago. Oh. And so, what does this book mean to you? How are you, how did you, can you paint us the, finish the portrait of, of from England to Canada, landing here, taking on this job. When I got in the car with you the first time, you, you were boasting to me about how great this job was, mm -hmm. how it provides for your family. Uh -huh. Take us into your mentality today and also share with us some wisdom uh -huh. on what this book meant to you and what your relationship with it and how, how we can learn from that. Well, this book, uh, the magic of, uh, after magic of thinking book, this, uh, this was the next book which actually- Yeah, Who Moved My Cheese. This, this book uh, actually uh, was the one who really impressed me, Who Moved My Cheese. So this book actually gave me an idea about, uh, more deep idea about life, you know, how to evaluate your opportunities, strengths and all, you know, how to move ahead in life, where to uh, get uh, connected with things and when, and keep analyzing them, them all, all the time, you know, and then uh, you should be able to know that, you know, uh, By the way, as you keep talking, we're now, we're now driving at the foot of the CN Tower. Uh, so let me just change the address again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for those of you that know Toronto, this is the largest freestanding structure in the world for 30 years. It was recently overtaken by um, uh, the Burj, I believe it's called, in, in, in Dubai, yeah. bringing it back to Dubai again. But still the largest freestanding structure in the, in the Western Hemisphere. It's covered in glittery lights. At the, we're at, right at the foot of, we're driving right by the Sky Dome now where the Blue Jays play. Uh, I refuse to call it by any other name. Uh, Ripley's Aquarium. Uh, and then we've got the Air Canada Center where the Maple Leafs and the Raptors play. We're in a traffic jam because there's probably a game on somehow tonight. And I'm just going to change. I'm just going to change the address here. Let's go uptown. Let's go to Young and Eglinton, and uh, keep this conversation going, Bish. Um, okay, I'm just changing the address. Update. Um, I got it. Okay, great. Um, so keep, I sorry to interrupt you, but I didn't want to end the trip. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you're gonna get called. So uh, who moved my cheese actually has taught me uh, how to basically uh, judge and evaluate the opportunities, how to really regenerate your life all over again, and find out new opportunities in life and grow in a right career path. That's where I learned. As, as the name titles, you know, who moved my cheese. Basically, a lot of us don't realize uh, the opportunities or the work or whatever we are into is actually dying also sometime. We never realize that, you know, uh, we uh, one day it'll actually end and we still try to uh, get stuck to those things and we don't uh, realize and we don't want to accept also sometimes that, uh, you know, uh, that this thing will actually end. And uh, well, let me, let me try, how will I explain you this? 
you can explain it to me, but also all three of your books, uh-huh. okay, Who Moved My Cheese, The Magic of Thinking Big, and You Can Win by Shiv Kara, uh-huh. all have to do with the malleability uh-huh. of the mind. Yes. You have talked about your mind being amorphous, excited, uh-huh. optimistic from a young age, uh-huh. but you've constantly sought to shape it. Yep. When I met you and when I talk to you now, uh-huh. I feel good about myself. Wow, so nice. I feel happy. Same here, Neil. I'm so excited after meeting you from the day one. You know, my goal was to, uh, though it was 4.98 when I met you, and <laughs> it, it was after a an year. And it was 4.98 at that time after so many months. And I was doing all my best, but I was not able to move that 4.98 to 4.99. There was some magic you created. And after that, I did even better, even better that I moved it to 4.99, which was the credit goes to you, absolute you. Oh my that gosh. 1.1 was just because of you, Neil. You are hilarious. <laughs> you are so funny. <laughs> I, I, I'm so appreciative of your kind words. And we both know that I hacked into the kernel of the Uber database. <laughs> no, I did not do that. Obviously, I have no idea. I don't even know how to use Microsoft Word. No, but I, I think that is amazing because I know from working at Walmart, we used to have this thing at Walmart, which was called out of stock. Uh-huh. Okay, it was a percentage that we tracked because, uh-huh. as you know, if you go shopping at a Walmart uh-huh. and they don't have lettuce, uh-huh. or they don't have Cheerios, uh-huh. or they don't have cotton balls, uh-huh. you're not happy. So we had something internally, and in, sort of in the in the sort of um, 2000s, we called the Fortune 500, uh-huh. not the Fortune 500 in the magazine, but uh-huh. we called it the 500 most important items in the store, okay. and we wanted to make sure that in stock level was like you know, as close to 100% as possible. Uh-huh. So we would get, and we would measure this number, and it would be like 98.9%, uh-huh. 99%, 99.1%, 99.2%. As I'm sure people listening might know, what I'm about to tell you is not gonna be a surprise. Uh-huh. The closer you get to 100%, uh-huh. every single decimal point is almost double or triple the difficulty. You're right. Because to go from, as you said, you went from a 4.98, with thousands of rides to a 4.99. You must have had to get like another 500 fives in a row to n- nudge that thing up. And even one four or one three will be tumultuous for you. That'll, call, that'll be like a three, six months to, that to overcome was, that. That was my job, Neil, after meeting you. So I had to ensure my every ride has to be just five star. How did you do that? So for the last 500 rides, I was supposed to get only five star. How? And that's what I did. Tell me what you do to do that. Oh, well, I just do small little little things. I don't do nothing big. Like what? Okay, so, you know, the most important thing, I, w- I will say the secret of this uh, reading, what I feel is I don't ignore my riders. Mm. I give them the right place. I give them the right respect. Mm-hmm. I treat them really, really special. I've tried to call and text you like 20 times the last week or two to set this up. And whenever you don't answer your phone, I get an automated text message reply from you. It says, I'm going to read it right now for the listeners. You must have programmed this into your phone some, somehow. But I get an automated reply from you on text. It says, I am in a trip, comma, please text me if needed. Smiley face, thumbs up emoji. So you've programmed in a system to give to, as you say, not ignore your passengers. Exactly. I mean, it, but this is a text which I only send it to the people, those who know I'm doing Uber. Do you, is it automated? It is, it is a pre, you can pre, uh, pre-program wow. some, some kind of text in your iPhone. Wow. And you can set up as, a, as an absent message or you can manually, you, but you'll have to manually select out of a list of texts you have? Yeah. Okay, this one. List of contacts. I, so this is, no, basically when someone is calling you yeah. and you're not in a position to answer the call, yeah. you mm. choose to text them and then the screen pops up for five pre-designed messages, which you have done yourself. So let's say if Neil is calling me, Neil knows I'm doing Uber right now. Yeah. So I can choose my Uber text to Neil, but if someone who is calling me, he doesn't know I'm doing Uber, then I have a different message for him. What do you pick for those people? So I'll say I'm driving right now. Yeah. Allow me some time. I'll right. call you back. If, as it's, soon as if it's your family from India. Exactly. <laughs> 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 or it says, oh, for your family in India, it's like, I'm in the Marriott Hotel. <laughs> 
<laughs> or if it is from a doctor so far, like yeah. my clinics doctors clinic then I, I i can't do none of them right what do you so say i have to i have to say you know uh, 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 probably sorry i can't take your call call me right now yeah. you know like that and so number one thing you do is don't ignore your pastor keep going on that i didn't mean to interrupt but keep going what what else yeah, so, uh, no no one in this world would like to be ignored right do you agree to this i agree so i don't ignore my riders i don't ignore their choice i'm giving them the service they are not giving me any service so why am i expecting something from them hmm i am supposed to deliver i am here to deliver them yeah so let's do the job and keep it simple and what if they want nothing from you what if they want total silence from you and ignore you and so that's what you are supposed to gauge uh-huh. that's what i try to gauge with initial cuz i never forget to uh give them a wish like a morning or a afternoon or a evening i always talk to them i confirm their name i check their mood yeah and then according to their mood i i try to go around so the best and the safest thing is to start with a smile right nobody will hate you if you're smiling at least right right yeah <laughs> so then you can gauge him if he's turning you with a smile yeah. then you know okay he's in a right good light mood That's I, it. I once asked Robert Cialdini, the author of Influence, one uh-huh. of the most popular marketing books of all time, uh-huh. what his number one tip for me would be as a public speaker. He said, "Neil, it's so obvious, but nobody does it. When you walk on stage, tell your face you're happy. Smile." Yes. Most speakers walk on stage, they're nervous, they're excited, they're energized, yes. but they're not smiling. They're you not. You just said it. Start yes. with a smile. 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 Keep going, keep going. It is infectious, believe me. if even if he's an ab- i have so many comments you want to know i'll show you my app i have so many what, what comments what do they say in 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 one line and a two line are given by riders wherein they clearly say i was having a bad day when i drove with wish you know he gave me such a good uh, 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 treatment then i you know i made uh, he made my day good or whatever such kind of small little one liner they are just uh, you know when they write yeah i don't know what they mean but they actually made your day so in order to make your own day put your good efforts you'll get good compliments in you that makes your day i love that and how do you gauge their mood you said gauge their mood as if that was easy but some people are not good at mood gauging how do you gauge the mood how well uh, you cannot be so accurate in gauging the mood right mm-hmm. but you can reach to a level where you can understand you're supposed to be calm quiet silent or you can talk what do you someone. look for specifically give me your sherlock holmes a response Mm. a reaction what kind of a reaction is coming from them mm. most of the time the riders they're not just like one or twice once or twice over riders they've been driving for a while they know uh, you know that this is a uber ride and how it is going to be and all those things i basically try to uh, try to break the ice by appreciating people mm-hmm. you know so when you appreciate someone it is most likely most likely i'm saying it is not 100% but most likely that when you appreciate someone you are not discom- discomforting uh, you're not giving a discomfort to him or her right mm-hmm. they will surely come back with a positive remark or positive affirmation sentence or a line or a word to you yeah so i always try to open my uh, conversation and if they don't say anything then you give them quiet if they just like sometimes i say hi to people uh-huh. and they don't say hi back they look at me to you know i guess be not too rude uh-huh. but they don't want they clearly tell you they don't want to talk it's like when you get on a plane and you sit down beside someone you're like hey how are you and they're like hmm uh-huh. then you don't talk is that right it happens but you know i'm so lucky i'm in city of toronto which is a set of great 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 people people are so warm here people are so welcoming here cuz this city is unique i've been to many cities in the world like london like london uk like dubai i'm from india i've been to delhi mumbai and now in toronto uh, toronto has a different flavor all put together in people it the city is formed i think this city is formed with the dreamers mm. so dreamers are never rude they are good people i never came across in all kind of my almost 5000 rides anybody who would not uh, uh, accept his appreciation accept a smile i have i'm still yet to see one tough nut you know that mm. kind of a person toronto is a city of dreamers i couldn't agree more i'm in the back of your uber doing a interview with you uh-huh for arguably no reason <laughs> but i'm dreaming about something and the learning and the conversation is special to me uh-huh. tying it to books is important to me uh-huh. learning how you create great service is incredible to me uh-huh. seth godin i was going to get back to this says that we should do a book together you're going to hear it if you listen to my interview with him cuz i interviewed him for the show uh-huh. and i told him about you and he said you got to do a book we should title it 
4.99 and it's like 50 secrets, 50 uh -huh. service secrets from the world's greatest Uber driver. <laughs> wow. You want all 50 to be given right now? Give me, well, give me, <laughs> give me three, give me two or three, give me two or three. You've given me a lot about cleaning the mat, about the, giving people the agency to own, own the, the relationship with the ride. Believe me, people don't even care if your car is not clean. You are supposed to be more clean than car. You're supposed to be more uh, uh, respectful to people. You're supposed to be more careful with people. They don't care. Even if you're, if you're not driving well, if your car is thinking bad, whatever. This is my out, uh, experience that people want to be treated well. That's it. They don't care about car. They don't care about what route you're taking. They don't care about how, but overall you should, how well you treat them. That's the most important thing. What I experienced in the last 500 rides. Believe me, Neil. It is about the treatment what you're giving. But them. Vish, you're a human. Yeah. That means you have to eat. Yep. And I get into a lot of cars that smell like food. Yep. And I think either the previous passenger had food or the driver uh -huh. probably needed to eat lunch or needed uh -huh. to eat dinner. So he kind of snuck a little burger on the side or had some had some uh, takeout. Well, well, how I'm, do you do with that? To be honest, I'm careful about that thing because it, 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 is, it is some very important point which I can't ignore. Sorry, sorry, buddy. So it is an important point. Uh, I can't we just cut it. someone off, but but that was because I <laughs> changed the fruit. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so uh, I try not to eat anything which can uh, actually create that kind of uh, uh, a smelly thing. So I, I only bring like fresh vegetables, like raw vegetables, like salad with me. I just eat that for whole my day. Wow. Yeah, that's that's my diet. Because actually. of the odor. Yeah, because of the odor. Yeah. So you are on a raw vegetable diet yeah like, like to give better service absolutely you have to you, you see unless you don't input you cannot expect the output so if i'm expecting output to become a, you know a, a, a high rated driver or whatever because i never knew i'm the one of the highest this is what I, I, I know it's that i'm making it up but you you've we've agreed they don't have a leaderboard and for everyone i know when we release the show yep. t show me a better one yeah. That's what we'll say to people. Sure. Okay. So uh, then I have to really get into details. Yeah. Right. This is one of my details to keep the car clean, to be able to pro. And I, I, and one more thing I try to keep in my car, which is an air freshener. Yeah. So not because of me, for any reason, if my car has start giving me any different smell or any any strong smell, yeah. I, I quickly uh, spray my uh, uh, car freshener. What scent did you pick? Uh, so it's like a fresh lemon. Lemon. Okay, yeah. I like that. It's t a little bit innocent. It's not as strong as some but of these. I, I, I immediately I spray it and I immediately open my, my windows. Oh, so okay. I put the, both both the things together. I don't want my car to have any kind of smell. Okay, so smell. I feel like we've covered cleanliness. We've covered because yeah. you've talked about cleaning the mats, wiping down the car every day. I also see a bottle of water here. Oh, why that's... do you have a bottle of water? What will you keep water in your trunk? Tell me how this water thing works. I... I, I, <laughs> why do you have water for people? This is this is just to add a a, a little more uh, over your service. So I think most of the most of the time. By the way, uh, Vish's phone just rang and he sent them a text message <laughs> saying. Uh, <laughs> that's my wife. I sent her a different message. <laughs> oh, okay, you don't have to tell me that message. Yeah, yeah. No, the same message. Okay. Yeah. So I, you saw how did I do that? I did, yeah. It popped yeah. up and you just yeah, picked one. Yeah. That was great. So there was four And you times. did it like, yeah. like amazing. Okay. So tell so, me about the water. So water thing is basically uh, just adding more value to your uh -huh. service. You For know. no cost. Pretty much no cost because you don't pay a lot of money to buy a case of water. Well, I'm looking at this. This is nice water. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a Nestle Pure Life spring water. If I bottle a bottle of water, this is the exact bottle I would buy. Is it? No, wow. I don't like distilled water. That's uh -huh. just like, you uh -huh. know, reverse osmosis. It's just tap water through a filter. I don't like that stuff. Uh -huh. And I don't necessarily go with the, the store brand stuff because I don't know why. I just like, it's private label and I just like don't, I don't know why. Sometimes I don't trust it as much. Uh -huh. So I would pay, buy this exact water. So uh -huh. you're, you're giving me not just water, but you're giving me the exact water I would buy. And if I bought this at a restaurant or a price, it'd probably cost me one or two dollars. Wow, that's great. So right so, away on my trip, uh -huh. this trip is going to cost me like, I don't know, because we're going on for a long time, <laughs> but this is, I get a couple dollars off in my uh -huh. head, a couple dollars of value. Oh yeah, definitely. That's what I think, uh, Neil. When I when I keep a bottle and I see the price of the bottle, it, it, it merely is nothing for me. I think the value, what I'm giving to my rider is much more than the money I'm paying for the bottle. Right. So the value is why I say value because when 
most of the riders when they do uber they don't plan they don't plan to bring their food their water their drinks with them they're running in between work they're right. running they're running. thirsty they're thirsty everybody and, needs water and suddenly they realize they are thirsty mm-hmm. so now in a ride how do they get the water so i just try to make it available i'm not giving it to everyone and then you replace it every drive like i just drank some you now between the next and the next one you got to go to your trunk and get yeah. a new water yeah, that's how you so i keep three bottles in the front here uh huh so two at the back and if somebody says can i take a few bottles for my meeting you let them oh yeah why not Hmm. How many of such incidents will happen? Yeah. Once in maybe hundreds, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's really. a guaranteed five star when you so do. I keep a case of my uh, the whole of like twenty seven thirty bottles. Can I ask you a question? Well, if yeah. I come to your car and I got a suitcase, do you put it in the trunk for me, or do well, I put I, it in the trunk for myself? To be honest, as soon as you appear, I'll ask you. Hey Neil, do you need any help? If you if mm. you ask if you are okay, then I'll quickly come out and help you. It's funny because. I take Uber to the airport a lot to travel uh-huh. and I I would guess uh-huh. that maybe 10% uh-huh. of Uber drivers would would offer or help me with my luggage. Uh-huh. 10%. Only 10%? I would think about 10%, yeah. And you know what, me? And when I get out, certainly they don't they don't get out. Uh-huh. They don't get out to get the luggage. I'm not saying they should. I'm just asking if you do because my experience is that very very few people do that. Yeah, I learned it last time when wa- my wife was hailing a ride in Uber like a year and a half before yeah. and she had something uh, with her she was carrying home and she expected the driver to help her and uh, the driver didn't come out at all mm-hmm. though she told him to help yeah but he was so rude to so that point i uh, that 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 point i i uh, i realized how important it is to help uh-huh. a passenger right and especially a female one yeah so i make it a point every ride when i see a ri- my rider is coming with yeah. some sort of luggage or something I open my back window and I straight ask him or her, you know, hey, do you need any help? Right. So the, I and to be honest, Neil, and you ask it in a way that since I started it, yeah. asking, uh huh, out of five thousand, hardly five people must have told me, hey, yeah, if if you can, please. Really? Yeah, that's how it is. Oh, so that's funny. So it's up funny. to you how do you you know basically deal with people, right? I must. I'm I'm very weak, so of course I accept help. But that's is funny. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. So this is interesting now. Yeah. Is it interesting? You not you offer it and you offer it in a nice way. It's not like do you want me to get out? No, like, no, no. Okay. You can't, you know. You that's what I said you have to treat people well. Yeah. Do that and forget everything else. Yeah. Don't keep water even, don't keep your car clean. If you're treating them well, you're doing your half or more than the half of the job. That's what they expect from you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You would probably wear would you wear an Uber uniform if there was one? Like an Uber hat, Uber jacket? Cuz I know they're trying to brand the cars with the Uber logo and stuff but the drivers they look different. You oh. know whereas a taxi company all the cars look like red and blue or you mm-hmm. know red and yellow. Are you No, actually let me take Oh, yeah, I I'm ready to drive. Oh, ready provided to Uber give me a car branded with Uber thing and all. You'd and go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if if it is an Uber car. Right, right. Not right. mine. Okay, I understand. Now, why okay, look at we've talked a lot. We I'm with you cuz I I like you and I'm I'm so excited to talk to you because I I kind of feel like I have a kinship with you uh-huh. and I feel like I'm like you. I care about numbers that nobody else cares about. I want to do my best even though no one's tracking it, uh-huh. even though nobody's watching me. My blog always had a blog class on the side. I didn't win any like points or the most traffic. Like I w- there was no necessarily a ranking. I cared about it for me, for me. Yeah. So why do you care so much? No one cares. You said Uber doesn't care. You say that drivers don't really, you know, a passenger's not going to not hire you if your rating's 4.4 or 4.5. You even actually are getting throttled a bit. You're not even getting as many rides. What gives you this root in your heart and in your stomach to even give a crap? Why? Oh, well, cuz you know, Neil, uh I can't adjust with uh for myself, I never can adjust with, you know, anything low, like a low rating or like a like a bad uh, uh, performer or like a, i don't like such kind of a tags mm-hmm. if if we talk in land sometime i can show you about my professional performances also yeah i always believe to be in number 1 and i tried always to be number 1 and i i was i was we're very much in toronto cuz two raccoons yeah. <laughs> just ran right in front of your car so not, it's it's a it's a personal thing inside you it's a you. personal thing mm-hmm. i i i just can't never adjust with uh, not being a performer when you what brought you to canada dreams as i said what were your dreams uh what are your dreams so after i had my daughter i basically wanted to create uh, to give her a good education basically mm-hmm. which i think uh, being in india also was possible but 
Canada has to offer some uh, more better education programs and she has she would have a less competition here because India being a large populated country she might have to face a lot of more competition there and and maybe journey and you know getting into the uh, career will be a little more hard for her and which I and my wife had already so I thought let's 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 create some different uh, experience for her so that was the main reason for us to move from there yeah, yeah. to give your daughter a better yeah. education yeah. Yeah. and and uh, how old is she now she's 13 she's and moving to she... high school next year wow yeah I can see your eyes light up as you talk about her <laughs> yeah but it must be hard to see her when you're working this hard yeah it's difficult sometimes Neil it's really difficult, but she knows I'm doing it for, 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 for some reason, like for her career, for betterment of her family, for settling down into this new country. And, and we all know that I'll not be doing Uber forever because mm -hmm. Uber is good. I'll be doing Uber at the side, but I cannot do it full time forever. Because mm -hmm. Uber is promising you only a short term uh, 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 career. Mm -hmm. It cannot give you a long term stability, right? Because mm -hmm. Uber. I know for, for the fact like Uber is uh, doing Uber job is a purely unsupervised job yeah. wherein Uber only values about the verdict of a rider not about a driver. You know what now the most hardest reality I'll tell you as we assume that uh, 4.99 is one of the best ratings in the, in, in the city of Toronto and blah blah blah. I think the world. Do you know? If in this ride, after getting down, if you write one line to Uber that, hey, I, I had a ride with Wish and he was one of the most unsafe drivers mm -hmm. to be driven on roads, yeah. you know what Uber will do? Uber will not even wait for a second to contact me. They will deactivate my, deactivate my account permanently. Permanently? Permanently. Permanently. This is what, this is, this phrasile, this job, this opportunity is all about. Do you think after having this kind of such a fragile opportunity, somebody can really, really build a career on this? Fragile. Such a fra you're saying such a fragile. Fragile, like yeah, easily yeah, broken. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. So, so you're every ride you're hoping. So there is no hoping, security. This is 100% insecure. I mean, we well. just heard a horn go by 15 minutes ago as someone sort of, you and you yelled out, sorry, That's, even though the guy could obviously not hear you. You were legitimately sorry for driving to grab the cutoff off the highway. This is what I do all the day because, you know, this is such an insecure opportunity. Any rider, you know, any rider, any time, if you are showing up to be like real in front of them, real in the sense, uh, okay, my, I, I, have a, I have a bad mood, so let me be open to them. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, but you're not supposed to, right? Yeah. Because you're into a job right now. If you're in a bad mood, go offline and go home. Right. Don't work. Yeah. No one is forcing you, right? Wow, that's a, that, you know what? I, we have so much mental health issues in organizations right now. Uh -huh. And one of my biggest pieces of advice when people say, what do I do on a bad day? Is the number one thing I say is go home. You will do way too much damage if exactly. you stay at work. You'll say the wrong thing to your boss. You'll send a nasty email. You'll have a headache, and then you'll, exactly. your work output is crap already. Exactly. So you may as well go home, say that you're not feeling well, and leave. First thing you got to do, and you just said the same thing, take yourself out. Yep. That's Call what your own do. number. Yeah. Pull, go to the bench. Absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. Endorse every single word of you, Neil. That's what I think. If you, if you will stay on the road, you will kill someone. You will spoil your own business. You will exactly. you'll spoil the day of the rider. Or it, go offline, take break, whatever. But just do when you do, you do completely. That's what is my mantra. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I believe in uh, repo. You know, repo building. Repo. Repo building. No, I don't. Like when you when you meet someone for the first time. Oh, rapport, rapport building. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm not trying to say it a different way. I just didn't, oh, I didn't my, hear it. my accent no, is Indian. No, 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 it's <laughs> Indian English. <laughs> my parents are Indian. It's so embarrassing. I, I'm, I'm like not listening. I'm like I grew up with my dad from Amritsar, and I'm like okay, anyway, keep going. I'm sorry. So, I didn't, I didn't uh, catch so, that. I, when you build rapport with somebody. So I think uh, the most important thing when you meet a new person or a, or a stranger, you are supposed to build up a rapport, mm -hmm. and which, which lot of drivers I assume they don't care about it they still try to think that a rider will uh, uh, build a repo with you mm. my question is that whose business is this is a rider's business or your business right so if it is your business he is your customer is he your customer or you are his customer yeah if he's your customer if he's your business he's giving you money then it is your job to build a repo with him right so the, if you don't build the right repo with a rider 
you are more likely to you're more likely to get, create a confusion about you as a person as a driver mm-hmm. you want you want to be razor sharp clear about who you are what you stand for exactly you shout your values that's how we all you know often time at the end of these shows I, I, I talk about one of the values of three books uh-huh. I talk about how we um, don't love e-readers and I talk about how we believe curation uh-huh. is so important in a world of infinite choice and I talk about how we have no ads on the show and why we don't have ads because we when you open a book there's no ads you don't want to be interested Interrupted in the middle of a great conversation. So I believe in shouting your values. Mm-hmm. Only one grocery chain shouts their values, Whole Foods. Uh-huh. And it's the only grocery chain that you can tell them, You can, people can tell you what they stand for. Uh-huh. Right? That's shout absolutely your right. values. Yes, absolutely right. That's what I try to do. I shout for my values. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've realized Toronto is a multicultural city with a with lot of immigrants all the time. So English is just one language common among all of us. Because that's the only bridge. But the most weird part is every person living in Toronto would speak a different language, different English language. Mm-hmm. You know, have yeah. you experienced this? They, have, they all have a different uh, slang. It's and, the same language yeah. but different slangs. Yeah. So it's so easy to get confused with, with people, you know, what is he saying, what is he not saying. So I, before I uh, give them the opportunity to get confused about me or doubtful on me, I try to clear, you know, and I try to make that repo and I try to convey uh, that what are my intentions towards this ride and what am I trying to do. I always check with them, where are they going? Yeah. Are you heading for work? Are you heading for uh, uh, home? It's just a question, but for me it's a magic question. I, I try to take out the information, like if they're going to work, it means they have certain deadline to reach. Mm-hmm. And then I try to work on my drive. I then all, I immediately I ask them, okay, so my, this is a typical conversation I do with them. So uh, can I give you a sample? Yeah, okay. yeah, let's so, do a role play. <laughs> so um, let's say you open up the door. Yep. So I'll, uh, well, Uber says that you ask the name to the rider, yeah. but I generally, I think it's odd for a couple of them. I tried in the beginning, people get irritated when you ask them, hey, good morning, what's your name or whatever. So people <laughs> don't does, like it, right? That does feel a bit like, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you're sitting beside someone on an airplane there. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I do it reverse. I say, hey, hi. So uh, Uber for Neil, for example, yeah. Neil is hailing me. So I'll say, hey, uh, hi, is it uh, uh, Uber for Neil? Mm-hmm. With the same tone. Yeah. And if he's Neil, he'll definitely say yes. Yeah, right? it's not a question. It's like you're just confirming, confirming a statement. Confirming, yeah, yeah. I'm getting the right person picked up. Right. So he'll say yes. So I'll say, hey, hi, please come in, come in, come in. So. That is how I start the ride. It's a welcome. That's a welcome. Welcome to my office. Welcome to my car. So this is creating a positive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. This is creating a a welcoming message to Mm -hmm. him. So do you think even after welcoming like this, this is one note. So once he's inside the car, my next question will be that. I'll give him two, three seconds, five seconds to settle. Then I ask him, hey, do you have enough room there? Wow. That's the basic courtesy, right? Yeah. If you don't ask someone, you know, and he's just struggling with the space or whatever. Now, this is a habit. I keep asking everyone. And I think people like about that. Yeah. A couple of them told me that I have done almost 200, 300 rides with Uber, but this is the first question I'm listening. First time anyone asked about legroom. But legroom and all. Yeah. So he was so happy. Even day. when I sat down today, you moved, the first thing you did was move the chair up. That's how you Because I'm extremely tall. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm not. I'm five foot nine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my third thing I do. Then keep going. And then I, uh, then I uh, confirm them right the address where they're going. Mm-hmm. That's my job, right? Because if I don't confirm, and by mistake, if the software has picked up a wrong address, I'll take them to the wrong address, which uh, happens so many times. Right. People do a pin. Yeah. So they drop a pin. So and I, they don't it, even know where they're going. Exactly. And yeah. some, sometimes these uh, apps have. The preset addresses for home and offices. Right. So many times I realize I'm at the workplace of someone and trying to call, hey, where are you? And they say, no, I'm not there. That's my workplace there. I'm trying oh, to go there. No. But what are you doing there? Then, you know, you realize the software has a glitch and they picked up a wrong address. Oh. So it is better to have such kind of surprises later. You check them before. Right. So I quickly confirm the address. Hey, mm-hmm. hi, are you still heading for this address? Right, right. Go to the airport, and, got it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then they say, yes, then I start. And the th- mm-hmm. fourth thing I do is I always i always confirm them the estimated time of arrival oh you say that it is must as for me right i've so, never been i don't think i've been asked that before maybe other than you 
Like it's gonna take 25 minutes to get there. You say that? You can roughly say, "Hey, hi, Neil." Uh, so I see my navigation says it's around 11 minutes. We'll take around to reach there. Okay. Are you? Does this sounds good to you? Oh, I ask this. Interesting. So I think these kind of uh, positive. Why do you ask questions, that? The time. No. What if they say no? That's not good. Be there in eight. So with that, I come to know whether he is in rush or not. Oh. So if he says, "Oh yeah, 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 I'm okay," out of ten, nine point nine or nine would say, "Oh yeah, it's okay." So if you you are looking for that one, if possible, yeah. So that someone says, "Oh, can you make it pos- uh, faster?" Then you know you're supposed to be a little more alert on the road to be on the faster lanes, right? To be able to write more effectively, yeah. And then you have a task to be completed, a target to because this yeah. person is in rush, and that is the reason he is called for an Uber. That's right, because otherwise they, they might not never enjoying, take an Uber. Yeah. They might they might be exactly. taken the subway. So the purpose of his uh, uh, you know service uh, request should be actually taken care, right? Speed. That's you want what speed. I try to. So I try uh-huh. not to break the law, but I try to be in more effective driving mode, right. like a little faster. Like yeah, you know. and, and even you're also showing him that you're trying to go faster. Even if you're not going faster, you're probably showing him that you're trying to go faster. Like on a yellow light, you maybe go through no, basically, instead of hitting no, the stop. No, then I ensure, then I ensure yeah. that I, if it is, let's say it is 10 minutes, so it is right now yeah, uh, 9.39, so right. 9.49 is the arrival. Uh-huh. I try to make this 9.48, 47 or something. Wow. So at the end of the day, he knows that which did an effort, yeah. at least to save two, three minutes. Wow. That's it. It's not big, but you can do that, right? Two minutes, three minutes. Can I just summarize this? Yep. So, and I'm not saying you're done here because you also said you confirm if they're going to home or to work. Yeah. So you said it's um, uh, Uber for Neil. Yep. Then it's come in, come in, come in. Like, yep. a, like a sort of friendly welcome into my place. Yep. yep. Then it's um, you're going to and then say the address. Yep. So that they make sure there's no miscommunication. Yep. And it's 11 minutes. Does that work for you? Yep. Oh, then what happens after that? Do you have any other questions or is the survey over now? Yeah, no, uh, th- that's where it's just the beginning. Oh, yeah. It's just the beginning, right? Yeah. Till then, you understand the temperament or the mood of the rider looking at his responses. Right? If right. he's really uh, quiet. You've got five questions now. You've got to engage the mood. Yeah, this is the gauging of the mood, right? Mm-hmm. Then, then, then you can probably ask, you know, hey, so where are you heading today? Uh, you know, where are you heading right now? Looking at the time, if it's morning, most of the people are headed to work, right? Mm-hmm. So you can always uh, guess, like, oh, so it seems you are heading for the work. You know? What do you do when someone is out of sorts? They are inebriated, they are drunk, they are high, they are sick. What do you do in those situations? Oh, sick is something else, but the drunk, Yeah. to be honest, I... <laughs> I try to keep a distance from drunk people to drive. How do you do that? I don't you, drive. You don't, but you don't know if they're drunk when they call you. Well, I don't drive in those probable pr- hours where mostly the nice uh, people will become drunk. So I like them when they're still sober. Right. So I try to go home as... Say... So my uh, alarm is like, the moment I get the first drunk guy in my car, <laughs> it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One drunk, you're out. But then when that drunk guy, what do you do with him? And, and I'm asking partly as a customer, right? Because sometimes, you know, it's the party's late, it's I the don't... end of the night. Uh-huh. The person's like, oh my gosh, we just need to go home. Or the concert's over. Everyone's hailing an Uber in front. People are, you, how you just avoid those scenes? No, Neil, it's, it's very simple. You know, yeah. uh, we talked about... Uh, uh, my past career so uh, I did a lot of uh, variety in my past life you know I, I was a teacher you. I was a trainer I was uh, you know, finishing people I was doing customer care for people I was selling I was training people how to sell I was training so many things so uh, I learned one thing in the life experience is all about handling situations mm-hmm. if you say to yourself not to anyone else that you are experienced then you better know how to deal with situations mm-hmm. you cannot help people responsible for any fucked up situation, sorry that word, Not for okay. a tough situation. So if you're in a situation where there's a drunk guy in your car, it is your responsibility to deal with that situation. You just cannot blame that guy to be drunk. Right? This sounds exactly like the books we're talking about. So I try to Do deal- you have responsibility even though you didn't ask for that situation? Exactly. So you have to deal with that situation. So the variety of situations you have dealt in the life is known as experience. What else? Mm-hmm. 
I love how you value experience. It seems like we're getting, we're living in a world now where experience is becoming less valuable. And yet my favorite humans in the world are the oldest people on the planet. Like I, cause they have the most experience and they seem to share the most. And I, I, I could sit down with a hundred year old person mm-hmm. and I would never get up. I would be asking them questions. Absolutely. Same one of here, us Neil. fell asleep. Same here, Neil. Yeah. Cause That's they, a goal for me on the show to get the oldest they possible are, guests. They are the only people who will let us know what is not to be done. Mm. See, to be done is available readily on internet. Everybody knows how to do certain things. But they know what tricks will not really work because they've tried everything in life. Ah. Right? Yeah. So this is what is experience about me. I, if, I have an experience like 18 to 20 years of work experience when often people ask me it's fine a young guy can uh, be cheaper than you he has a lot of energy and he can beat up a job why will we hire you so I simply say you know he will know how things will work additionally I know how things will not even work yes right because I tried all those ways (laughs) and I got the failure with me you know what I'm sorry to bring Seth Godin back into this but he says I'm more proud of my failures because they have taught me more lessons yes uh, you know, I wonder if we close up this conversation. I, I could talk to you for hours. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for the, the motivation. <sighs> Is there a final? I know you want to write a book, so you can use this into the last question. Is there a final word of wisdom? The people listening are going to be interested in the service business and the marketing business. In the in the, you know, you're in a life. You're in the life changing business. You change lives. Yeah. How, how, what are your pieces of wisdom? at the end I think people don't expect a lot from you when they're in an Uber ride they just expect you to do your job and a lot of us do, they just forget to take off the hat what they're wearing since beginning of so if I'm an accountant and I'm doing Uber at the side I still try to become an accountant if I'm a sales guy I'm doing Uber at the side I still try to become a sales guy why can't you change the hat and become an Uber driver for that ride for that 10 minute, for that 15 minute, why can't you just do that job, what you are expected to do in that ride? A lot of us don't realize that change of hand. So I think this is one thing you're supposed to do. Second, why can't you treat people well? Assume you are in a store, this is a retail, and some customer is walking inside the store. He's going to pay you something. He is hiring you for that time of 15 minute or half an hour or whatever. What are you supposed to do as a corporate or as a company or as a, as, a, as a retail attendant? You're supposed to give them a good experience about that trip, good experience about that visit. That's all we're supposed to do. It's not a rocket science. Just be welcoming. Just be warm. Be like a common Toronto guy who are all so welcoming to everyone. Why can't we do a Uber ride like that? It is very simple. I think it's so simple to smile than to create some kind of anger expression. So let's smile. Uh, open the thing with a smiling face, smiling expression. And I'm sure out of 199% will turn out to be smiling back to you. This is as simple as that. That's, even if you're not happy, act you are happy. There's no harm. Eventually, you never know who is getting into your car or what kind of a mood he's carrying, what kind of a day he had. So at least... You don't spoil more. If he has a bad day, with your happiness, with your smile, you can actually change his mood a bit. And you're not marrying a rider. You're just riding for 15 minutes. Act something nice. That's your business, buddy. Good ratings, good compliments will keep you in the business. Right? And you're there to be in the business. Right? Getting the money for the ride is only fulfilling your money need. But what about staying in the business for long run is about... It's all, only all your ratings will keep you up. Mm-hmm. Be serious about your ratings. Mm-hmm. That's it. This has been one of the best conversations I've ever had. Is it? Thanks, 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 Neil. Thank you so much. You are incredible. And you've done this entire interview while driving to the airport, to the CN Tower. To Yaga- like, we've done circles and laps oh, around I the city. Know, I know. You've I been know. steering us up and down the highways. You have been so attuned. And you have had the microphone I gave you sitting in your front breast pocket 
the entire time well this was you your energy was with me neil you you your positivity your more uh, before coming to you i was listening to one of your videos there was the power came inside me you know neil <laughs> <laughs> you are this, you are so sweet i'm so have lucky to have met you thank you thank you vish for this conversation thank you We thank so you thank you so it. much neil thank you it was a pleasure of all mine thank you so much Start with a smile, and 99% of people will smile back. Sounds so obvious, but so many people don't start with a smile, right? It's just you walk into any Uber, or walk into any coffee shop, or walk into any restaurant. Do they start with a smile every time? It's just such a beautiful, simple thing to do. We fire the mirror neurons in each other's brains and get the trigger effect of building trust and building rapport, as, as Fish says. Fish had so many great quotes in this in this chapter. I loved listening to him. I could listen to him all day. He says, the more you read, the more you refine your thought process. He says, without books, you'll take 200 years to learn something. Books are the extract of life. He also says, either I do the thing or I don't do the thing. And he talked about the yes man and the no man paradigm. So many little nuggets of wisdom that he's using from all his experiences in sales, in Coca-Cola, in insurance, in Dubai, around the world in multiple continents, eventually landing here in Canada in Uber. Part of me suspects Vish is just going to keep going up and up and up. I, I just could not help feeling so joyful just hanging out with him. Um, and I owe him a lot because he really made time and space and supported this conversation. And I want to just give a shout out to him for doing that. Guys, this is a really special show for me, uh, and I hope for you. Uh, I'm trying really hard to avoid doing any ads, any sponsorships, any commercials on this show. I really want it to be a pure piece of art. I want it to be a gift. I want it to be something out in the universe to help us all find uh, those books that change our lives. That's the goal of the show. So the ways you can really support the show, if you want to, are really just by telling other people about it. You can go to threebooks.co. That's where the home of the show is. You can see the books that we have collected and discussed so far, as well as the blog posts highlighting the other chapters we've talked about. Or you can check us out online uh, or over the phone. I really would encourage you to give us a call. Our phone number is 1-833-READ-A-LOT. Again, it's 1-833-READ-A-LOT. Yes, it's a real phone number. And yes, there's a real voicemail. And yes, we listen to every voicemail message. And uh, we also have a secret password in that voicemail. So if you get the secret, if you call, you get the secret password, you get the secret entryway to a special secret three books club that I can't say more about, but the only way in is to call the phone number. And now, if you've waited till the end of the podcast, I'd like to welcome you back into the end of the podcast club. This is the club for people who listen all the way to the end of the show, end of the chapter, and we have a special connection where we talk directly to each other and I read some reviews and take some calls. Okay, with that, let's go to the phones. Hi, Neil. This is Naraya calling from Vermont in the United States. And I'm calling because I was listening to your episode with Gretchen Rubin. And you very kindly at the end of the episode um, had asked Gretchen to help you out with the word Cohen, which I had also never heard before. And then as it turns out, I was reading the book just yesterday called There Are No Grownups, A Midlife Coming of Age Story by Pamela Druckerman. And on page 19, she suddenly introduces the word Buddhist koan uh, in the context of shopping with her grandmother and that their own koan was, quote, why once you bring an outfit home, doesn't it ever again look as good as it did in the shop, unquote. Um, yeah, just thought that that was really interesting, and thank you so much for introducing that word to all of us, because uh, I was also wondering it, and I'm just really enjoying the podcast and how um, easily you ask good questions of people and ask for follow-up and freely admit what you don't know, which I think is uh, helps all of us at home feel like we're peers um, listening to this. Anyway, I'm going on far too long, but thank you. Take care. Thanks so much for the call, Mariah, from Vermont. Uh, don't worry about going on too long. And I do think we're all peers. We are all peers. We're all just giant collections of 
carbon and oxygen swirling around with a bit of consciousness for 30,000 days. You know, we don't even know what the universe is. We don't even know what it is. We don't know how big it is. We don't know how far it's going. We don't know where it came from. We have a Big Bang theory, but I think that this entire little span, this little blip of electrical consciousness awareness is just totally random and freakish and crazy and lucky. And I very, very much think that the more we can talk and communicate and connect with each other, the deeper and richer our lives can become. So thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts with us. Uh, and I know what you mean about, about words popping into uh, kind of view whenever you sort of first hear them. Like I was hanging out recently with Rich Roll. He is a fantastic host of a great podcast called the Rich Roll Podcast. If you don't know it, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, literally just start with the most recent episode and go backwards because he's a phenomenal interviewer. And I was talking to him and he used the phrase Zen Cohen in the middle of a sentence. Like he was just talking normally because he's just super articulate. He's like, yeah, it's like a Zen Cohen. I was like, oh my God, there it is again. So I totally relate to you. Speaking of that, let's do the word of the chapter for this show. And the word I wanted to highlight was extract. Extract. If you remember, Vish said, books are the extract of life. And I thought that was an interesting turn of phrase. So I looked up the word extract. And um, yeah, it means remove or take out, especially by effort or force. It means obtain from some, obtain something such as money or an admission from someone in the face of initial unwillingness. Uh, it's interesting to, 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 derive, to derive from a body of evidence or information. Extract, extract. So what is the origin of extract? Well, it comes from Latin. Ex, E-X, is out, means out in Latin. And tract comes from trahir, which means draw, like out, draw, or draw out, to pull out. Books are the extra to life. At first, I didn't really kind of get what he was meaning, but now I sort of picture it like the top of a lemon meringue pie. You know how it sort of has that like meringue, those little pinches, those little tufts of, of meringue at the top? Um, maybe that's what he means by books, right? Like we live and we've lived and we've used and, and created books for not that long. Let's say a thousand years if we're lucky. I know the printing press is only 500 years old, so it hasn't been that long since we've had books. And what kind of sort of history do we have of the world? Well, really it's books. We have Shakespeare, we have Marcus Aurelius, we have the Bible, we've got the, the Quran, we've got Seneca, we've got Epictetus, we've got the wisdom of the ages collected through passages and written notes that are sort of like the extract of life. So I thought I'd highlight that word, extract. The only other thing I want to do uh, this chapter is read a letter I received. Um, and let's close off this chapter by reading the review of the chapter. And as a reminder, we love reviews. If you could leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you uh, leave reviews, please do. Uh, every chapter of the show, we pick a random review, we read it out loud, and we uh, ask that person to contact us so we can mail them a signed copy of any of my books. Okay, so this this chapter, the review of the chapter, is written by Corey Blue 3 The subject line is, I have two new best friends. I'm never going to be alone again in the car. I love listening to the podcast when I'm by myself on long drives. It makes me feel like I have two best friends keeping me company. I appreciate that, Corey Blue, because you know when we started doing this this podcast, we kept it in left ear and right ear. And if you notice, we've edited the sound a little bit. So it's still in two channels, left ear and right ear, or left speaker and right speaker. But I've softened the sound and I've put it forward a bit. This is not me doing this. It's the help of a lot of people that are smarter than me in sound production. So I feel like now we've got a sound that is warmer and it's still two channels so that you feel like you're on the couch between us or in the driver's seat between us. As a final closing thought, I just encourage you to get in touch and get together with this amazing community we're building. One of our values is humans are the best algorithm. And I think in today's chapter with Vish, you really did feel that and hear that. So let us know what your book is. Give us a call, one eight three three read a lot Let us know what your most formative book is, and hopefully we can play that on the show next time. Thank you so much for listening. Until the next new moon or full moon, I am your humble servant, Neil Pasricha. Thank you so much for listening, and talk to you soon.